طيب بسم الله الحمد لله ثم الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه اللهم علمنا بما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب زدنا علما وارزقنا فهما وجعلنا من عبادك الصالحين Verily all praise and thanks be to Allah We thank him and we praise him We seek his assistance, we seek his guidance And we ask him to send his peace and, ble- his peace and blessings upon His noble prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what proceeds, my respected brothers We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for beneficial knowledge We ask him to teach us that which is beneficial And to benefit us from that which he taught us and to keep us upon guidance, upon steadfastness, and most importantly, upon ikhlas, upon sincerity. <coughs> it has been reported in Sahih Muslim on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, he asked his companions, Ala adullukum ala ma yamhu Allahu al khataya, Ala adullukum ala ma yamhu Allahu bihi al khataya. ويرفع به الدرجات قالوا بلى يا رسول الله He said to his companions صلى الله عليه وسلم Shall I inform you of something that will reap away that will weep away your sins that will be an expiation as a form of sins that will lift you in ranks as well قالوا بلى يا رسول الله They said yes of course a messenger of Allah and he peace and blessings be upon him said إسباغ الوضوء إسباغ الوضوء على المكاره that you make wudu you make wudu properly in difficult circumstances making wudu when it's cold maybe before you go to sleep making wudu when you wake up this is from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he also عليه الصلاة والسلام says لا يحافظ على الوضوء إلا المسلم لا يحافظ على الوضوء إلا المؤمن rather the one nobody maintains their wudu except except a firm believer except the one whose iman is 100% having wudu is a very noble and pious thing the second expiation of sins is وكثرة الخطى إلى المساجد وكثرة الخطى إلى المساجد taking many steps to the mosque the more steps you take towards walking the mosque, towards walking towards the mosque, the more it is an expiation of sins. We find that brothers, they always want to park right in the front. They want presidential parking. But let us inform each other that the further out you park, the better. The further you park, the better. Because the more steps you take, the more it is an expiation of sins. And the last thing is, and this will apply to all of us, بإذن الله, انتظار الصلاة بعد الصلاة. انتظار الصلاة بعد الصلاة فذلكم الرباط. And he says it again, صلى الله عليه وسلم, فذلكم الرباط, twice. Waiting for one prayer after another. Sitting down attentively, reciting the Quran, listening to the lecture or reminder in the masjid. From one prayer to another, from Maghrib to Isha, perhaps from Dhuhr to Asr, perhaps from Asr to Maghrib. فذلكم الرباط. The Prophet ﷺ says, فذلكم الرباط. That this is like guarding the frontier. This is like guarding the frontier. What does that mean? This is as if you have went out on a battlefield. And we all know the rewards of going out on a battlefield. And the one that dies in a battlefield. And this is referring to jihad fi sabilillah. You can attain the reward of jihad fi sabillah by being in a masjid from Maghrib to Isha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among them. My respected brothers and sisters, Al-Imam Al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he has a famous statement where he says, Kun aliman, fa'illam tastati' fa'kun muta'alliman. Be a scholar. He says, everybody in this world should be one of these four things. One is a scholar. 
If you can't be a scholar, then be a seeker of knowledge, a learner, somebody who's always willing to learn. If you can't be a seeker of knowledge, then be someone who loves or someone who's a servant to the people of knowledge. Someone who's a servant to the people of knowledge. And if you can't be that, then go and chase the dunya. Go and chase this worldly life. But at the same time, do not forget about your akhirah. Do not forget about your khams and salawat, your five daily prayers. Do not forget about fasting. Do not forget about your wajibat, your duties towards your parents. Be one of these four things. Our topic today, my brothers and sisters, is the purpose of this dunya. The purpose of this dunya. And I want to ask the brothers sitting in front of me, how many of you know this answer, the purpose of the dunya? I just want to know, raise your hands. Raise your hands if you know the purpose of this dunya. MashaAllah. One out of 50 brothers. Tayyip. That's quite worrying, huh? The purpose of this dunya, my brothers, it's something that us Muslims, we should ponder about and think about every day when we wake up. And the purpose of this dunya is more than where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ We have not created men or mankind and the jinn except that we worship them. It is more than that. The purpose of life is more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيْ لِيَخْتَبِرَكُمْ He is the one that created the death and, and, and life in order to test you. لِيَخْتَبِرَكُمْ means لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ in the Arabic language. In order to test your deeds. The purpose of life is more than وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, by the token of time, through the ages, verily mankind is at loss. Except those who believed, those who do righteous deeds, those who advise each other upon truth, the truth, qila al-Islam, qila al-Quran, this truth, they say it is Islam. They say it is the truth upon Quran and advising each other upon patience and patience has different levels and we'll speak about that my brothers how many of us have thought, have thought about this question what is our sole purpose what is our existence what are we doing here in this life why are we here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn and the mankind except that they worship me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the jinn first before mankind because he created them first. And the jinn are created from smokeless fire. And they have a duty to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And they are from the unseen. That which we'll never see in this life. But we have to believe in it is part of our iman it is part of our core faith our aqidah believing in jinn and shayateen we don't believe in ghosts and monsters but we believe in jinn and shayateen yeah we believe in angels the unseen allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unseen our messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam is unseen we've never seen him but we believe in him this is part of our faith part of our iman and we can't deny it otherwise we'll be out of the fold of islam so he says i have not created the jinn and mankind accept that they worship me. What does this worship me mean? I have brought about different tafasir, different exegesis or explanations of the Quran. Some of the scholars of the past, such as Mujahid ibn Jabbar, who is a scholar, who is a student of Abdullah ibn Abbas the great Mufassir, the companion of the Prophet وسلم, the maternal cousin of the Prophet والسلام, He says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ لِيَعْبُدُونَ أَيْ إِلَّا لِيَعْرِفُونَ Mujahid ibn Jabbar, who's a tabi'i, a student of Ibn Abbas, he says, 
لِيَعْبُدُونَ Worship me is that you, it means that you know him, you get to know him. لِيَعْرِفُونَ You study Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is Allah? Study his existence. عِلْمُ التَّوْحِيدِ مِنْ أَشْرَفِ الْعُلُومِ From the best and from the noblest of sciences is studying عِلْمُ التَّوْحِيدِ The sublime names and the beautiful attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many names does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have, my brothers? 99 and many more. وَمَنْ أَحْصَاهَا دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ حَفِظَهَا دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ The one that memorizes these names, understands them and learns them, and uses them as well. دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ He will enter paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 names outside of 99 names as well as others as well. Such as what the Messenger of Allah described him. إِنَّ اللَّهَ جَمِيلٌ يُحِبُّ الْجَمَالِ Allah is beautiful. In Allah Hayyun. Allah is alive. Yastahi. That Allah shies away. These are attributes that we can't deny. That we must affirm. As opposed to those who have went astray, those who are misguided, those who are deviant, who've denied parts of attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another meaning of Wama Khalaqtul Jinna wal insa illa liyabudun. And know this ayah is very important. Surah Dhariyat, ayah number 56. Ponder upon this ayah, my brothers and sisters. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ قِيلَ وَمَعْنَاهُ إِلَّا لِيَخْضَعُوا إِلَيَّ وَيَتَذَلَّلُوا Over here, some scholars again, they say, لِيَعْبُدُونَ That you worship him humbly, being humbly submissive. And that you give your khushu' You give your focus to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is in terms of ibadah. And we'll come to ibadah in a minute. And the third meaning, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ أي إِلَّا لِيُوَحِّدُونَ Over here, the scholars, they said again, لِيَعْبُدُونَ Worship me, is that you? Make him one. You single, you single Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you single him in his worship, in his lordship, and in his actions, and in his perfect, and in his sublime names, the perfect attributes. You single, Allah, you single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his worship, how? That your worship is solely unto him. That you don't associate any, part, any partners or anyone else with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is singling him out in his worship. As opposed to the Quraysh al Kuffar, the enemies of the Prophet, they used to believe in Allah, they used to, they used to say, We believe in Allah, but they used to associate partners with Allah through these 300 gods they used to worship, Hubal being the biggest of them. We as Muslims, we worship Allah alone without any partners. Also, another form, another way we can sing Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in His, in his Lordship. In his lordship, that he is a Rabb, that he is the one that nurtures, he is the sustainer, he is the provider, he is the one that brings down the rain. Not science, or not the weather channel, or not what I say, you say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that brings down the rain, and he is the one that, says, that provides for us rizq. This concept of rizq, it comes from him only, not Centrelink or your workplace. Or your boss, you have to tell yourself that Allah is the one that provides for me, and I go and chase the means. By working nine to five, I provide for myself. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the razaq. Do you hear my brothers? Also, the third manner or the third way we can single Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his worship, in, in his that that which is in his perfect names, in his perfect attributes and beautiful names. That he is the everlasting, Al Hay. That he is Al Qayyum, the sustainer. That he is Al Ahad, the one and one and only. Yeah? This is single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his beautiful names and perfect attributes. Then we then we go to Ibadah, this concept of Ibadah. Ibadah it means worship, my brothers. Worshipping Allah and that which He loves and that which He desires. 
from actions and sayings, statements. Worshipping Allah in that which He desires and loves in actions and in statements. And ibadah does not mean ritual worship. Other, form of, other, other religions, they have this concept of worship. One religion, they worship their God only one day a week on a Sunday. And they come together and have a feast one time in a year. Then they celebrate the death or the birth of their third God or whatever it is. Another religion, they come together on Saturdays and they worship Allah only on Saturdays. We Muslims, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 24-7. Rather 24-8, even in your sleep. As Imam ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala says that a abd, a servant, should worship Allah 24-7 even during his sleep. How do you worship Allah during your sleep, my brothers and sisters? That you make wudu before you go to sleep. That you have the intention to wake up for qiyam al-layl. That you have the intention to wake up for fajr. That you read the adhkar that has been legislated. Ayat al-Kursi. The last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun. Read in Qul wallahu ahad. Wal mu'awwidatayn. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. Read these before you go to sleep. And the angels will make dua for you. The angels will seek istighfar for you even during your sleep. And if you die, my brothers, and we have seen how many brothers die in their sleep and not wake up, then you have died bi idhnillah upon khayr. Today we just buried a young brother, 24 year old, 25 year old. Death, my brothers and sisters, it has no limit, no limitation, no time. It can come to you now at this moment. It can come to you in a years, in a years down the track. It can come to you tomorrow. It can come to you when you're 40, when you're 60. But you as an abd, as a servant, have to be ready, have to be prepared. So my brothers and sisters, we don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whenever we want to. Whenever we want to, whenever we desire. Like the one that comes to the masjid just on Fridays. The one that turns to Allah when he's been afflicted by calamity. This person is not a serious worshipper. In fact, the one that comes to the masjid just on Fridays and doesn't pray all the, other, all the other prayers, he's not a true Muslim. This guy worships his desires. And this is not what I've said, this is not my statement. This is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَاهُ Have you seen the one that takes his ilah, his God, as his own desires? He just comes on Fridays. He prays all his prayers before he goes to sleep. <laughs> Fajr, he might pray at 9 a.m. just before he wakes up to go to work. And Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, he's praying before sleep. He's juggled his prayers. This is not a true Muslim. This person is worshipping his desires. The one that does not pray at all, don't worry about him. This one has a different ruling. Or don't worry about her. The scholars, they even discuss that is this person, even, even, even in the religion himself, is this person, what is the difference between this person and Bob and Jane and Samantha? Right? If he doesn't pray whatsoever, the Messenger of Allah told us, Al Ahdu Ladi Bainana, Wa Bainahum as Salah, Faman Tarakaha, Fakat Kafar, Faman Tarakaha, Fakat Ashrak, different narrations, O Kamaqala alayhi salatu was salam. The covenant between us and them is the prayer. The one that leaves it has indeed fallen into disbelief. The one that leaves it has indeed fallen into um, polytheism. Leaving off prayers is one of the most greatest and dangerous of acts. It is a grave sin. Sins are of levels, my brothers and sisters. Leaving off prayer is one of the greatest ones. So my brothers and sisters, we have to be serious about our prayers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us and he says, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban mawquta That the prayer has been described upon the believers at a specified time. Not whenever you like, on our like, I pray. We need to pray at its... <coughs> we need to pray at its specified time, given time. Fajr has a specific time. Dhuhr has a specific time. Asr has a specific time. Maghrib, as we just prayed, has a specific time. Isha 
Isha is a bit lenient. From the Sunnah acts is that the Prophet used to pray before he used to go to sleep. The last thing you do as a Muslim before you go to sleep, pray your Isha prayer. But if there's a congregation and we all want the rewards, the rewards are greater than praying in a congregation than praying by yourself. By how much, my brothers? Naam, by 27. 27 times greater. So imagine the one that prays five times a day in the masjid. Multiply that by 27. This person, his akhra bank will be heaps. Trillion. Right? Infinity. His akhra bank. So just to get those rewards, my brothers. <coughs> so we don't take any vacation from our ibadah whatsoever. That is the sole purpose of our creation. We've been created to worship Him. And there's no holidays in worship whatsoever. And this is governed by the divine commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where He says, Inna salati, قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say, O oh Muhammad, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa addresses his, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa through his nation. Right? And a, and a principle, my brothers and sisters, anytime you see the word qul in the Quran, it is not to just the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa it is to us as a nation as well. We, we have been commanded as well. How many times does the word qul come around? Qul inna salati wa nusuki, qul huwa Allahu ahad. Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'mineen. Say, O oh Muhammad, Allah is one. Say, O oh Muhammad, that your prayer and your nusuk, your sacrifice and your living is solely unto Allah. That is what ibadah is. All your prayers, all the good deeds that you do is solely unto Allah. The moment you associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves these prayers, leaves these deeds. The moment you have any type of riya, show boast, uh, boast, boasting or showing off, whether you lead prayers, or whether you come to the masjid just to be seen, or whether you fast, or whether you pray just to make your parents proud, then that ibadah, that act is not, is not accepted. Because if you associated something with, you, with the ibadah with something else, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us ikhlas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us sincerity. <coughs> so my brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ He is the one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that created death and life in order to test you. So your worship, you were created to worship, to serve Him. And your worship will be tested. How will your worship be tested? Your deeds. Some of the scholars again, they say, if your deeds are correct, you'll be tested according to your deeds if they are correct or if they are <coughs> sincere. If they are sincere, if they are only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they are correct, if they are in accordance with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa That is how your deeds will be tested. I can pray all night. I can fast all day and all night. I can come up with matters for myself. But if this is not in accordance with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and if this is not sincerely to Allah, then my deeds have been rejected. And my deeds are going to be tested no matter what. <clears throat> also, my brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us again وَالْعَصْرِ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ By the token of time, through the ages and this is this is a form of qasm where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing upon time and we all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not swear upon a thing except that it shows its importance how important is time? how much do we neglect time? time is of essence my brothers Time is important. 
Time kills. You know that saying, let's kill time. No, rather, time kills you. We don't kill time. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ By the token of time, through the ages. My brothers and sisters, our livelihood, on average, they say the average Aussie lives about 80 years. 81 to 82 years. <coughs> the average Aussie. And during this time, you will spend the calculation, you will spend about 20 years working in the workforce. By the time you retire, by the time, by the time after you graduate from university, by the time you look for a job, by the time you have a career in the corporate or small businesses or whatever it is you do, from that moment, let's just say 30, 30 up until 50, 55. That's the time you're in your prime. That's the time you're working. That's the time you're saving up. And they say you spend about at least five to six years on devices, these things here, these gadgets. Yeah, these gadgets, you spend about five years of your life, the 80 years, five to six years, just looking at this phone. And this is the average person. People, my brothers and sisters, can't even go to sleep nowadays. Some people can't go to sleep without looking at their phone, without scrolling through their social media, TikTok, Snapchat, news feed after news feed, Snapchat after Snapchat. They keep scrolling next, next, next until they fall asleep. Wallahi, I know an individual that can't go to sleep without, without being on their phone, and that's how they fall asleep. And you ask him, Ya Akhi, what are you doing? Ya Akhtul Karima, what are you doing? They say this is a habit, what I'm used to. Social media is a drug. And it's killing our time. Not just that, it is killing our minds. And it's killing us as a whole. Then you will spend a specific amount of time, my brothers and sisters, you will spend a specific amount of time doing other matters. But the time that you spend worshipping Allah five times a day, 25 minutes, Right, five times a day, five, five times 25. <coughs> five times a day you pray, and on average you pray five to six minutes. Yeah, less than an hour of your day you give to Allah. Make, multiply that by seven. Then multiply that by how much days in a month? By 30. Then multiply that by a year. You've given yourself less than 10 years, not even, of your entire life. You've worked more. You've been on social media more. You've chased the dunya more. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just asking for one hour of your day. The average Muslim, the one that gets by, the one that has to, has to make ends meet, prays five times a day. And he prays five to seven minutes. And this is something that we struggle to find. Forget about the non-average. Forget about the one who's uh, in a higher stage, the believer. The one that adds extra prayers. The one that prays the 12 sunnah prayers, two before, two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, two after Isha. This person is on another level. The one that fasts, extra fast outside of the month of Ramadan. The one that fasts Monday and Thursday. The one that fasts, the sunnah fasts. Like Yawm al Arafa, like Yawm Ashura. On these specific days, the one that fasts whenever he has the means, he's on a different level. And the one that performs hajj more than what is required, you only have to perform hajj once, by the way. And the one that gives zakah, he gives the sadaqah from his own pocket, other than the zakah. This person is on another level. But I'm talking about the average Muslim, and we still struggle. You and I, we're average Muslims. And we still struggle, and we still don't take our time serious. Time kills my brothers. Al-Imam Ibn Qayyim, he has a famous statement and he says, Diya'ul waqti ashaddu min al-mawt. That wasting time is worse than death. How my brothers? لِأَنَّ الْمَوْتَ يَقْطَعَكْ عَنِ الدُّنْيَا وَأَهْلِهَا وَضِيَاعُ الْوَقْتِ يَقْطَعَكْ عَنِ الْعِبَادَةِ Because death prevents you from the life, from going back and wasting time. Whereas wasting time prevents you from worshipping Allah. So you're better off being dead than wasting your time. 
So let's take our time serious. Let's take heed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say wal as by time, except that it shows the importance. Awalam nu ammirkum maya tadakara maya tadakaru fihi man tadakara waja akumun nadir. Have we not given you enough time on this earth in order for you to have worship, in order for you to worship him? Waja akumun nadir. And there came to you a warner. And there came to you this warner. Some of the scholars they say, Motu, Motu al ahli wa aqaribi. That there has been a reminder for you and these people dying around you, your loved ones, your family. What have you done with your time, my brothers? Look at yourself and ask yourself, what have I done with my time? I'm 25 years old, 30 years old, what have I accomplished? You see, brothers, subhanAllah, six, seven years ago before I went to Saudi, the same brothers, older figures, whenever they would pray, Allahu Akbar, right? They will recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Then they will recite some of the smaller surahs. Wal Asr, Inna Al-Insana Lafi Khusr. There's nothing wrong with that. But you see this person, 10 years time, he comes, I come back. Yes, Ya Fulan, what do you have now? He still prays in the same surahs. He still reads the same surahs. He hasn't progressed. He doesn't make effort to read the surahs that are after that. After Wal Asr. He doesn't progress to read the whole of Juz Amma. Amma yatasa'alun. He doesn't progress to read the next surahs. Tabarak alladhi biyadihi al-mulk. The next Juz and that Juz and that Juz. You see two people. This one is at a loss. And you see this guy here who's young. At the age of 30, he's memorized the Quran. Whereas this one, at the age of 30, he's still on the same phase. Doesn't make any progress. This person, he's made progress. He's been memorized and taken in the Quran serious as a young age. This person has made an effort to memorize one hadith and to implement it. This person doesn't even bother. Time, right? They've taken use of their time. This guy here has graduated and finished uni. Four or five years in uni. Maybe medicine school, six years. This guy here is still at his mom's house. He's still living off his mom and dad. Time, my brothers. This guy here has moved on with his life. He's finished uni, alhamdulillah. He's become, a, he's become a doctor, an engineer, a teacher, a nurse. He's made something with his life. He started a spouse. He got married and has kids. This guy here is still at the same age. He's still at his mother's house. He's still waiting for his mom to make the food for him and to cook and clean for, her, for him. He's still living off the dough. Or maybe he's in haram means, Allahu Alam. This guy here has taken advantage of his time, this guy hasn't. Wal asri inna al insana lafi khusrin, my brothers, by time, by the age of time through the tokens, by the, by, the age, by the token of time through the ages. Mankind is at a loss. We are all in a state of loss, you and I. And notice how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says mankind. He did not say Muslim or non Muslim, religious or non religious, practicing or non practicing. He said, all of mankind, we are in a state of loss. Khasara. Right? إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ Except those that believe, those that have iman, those that submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they submit to their will. And the believers here are the ones that have 100% Iman, by the way, not just normal believers like you and I. Those that pray more than five times a day. <coughs> Those that have wudu and make wudu, as we mentioned in the start of the talk, throughout the day. And those that sleep upon tahara, they sleep upon wudu. Those that pray five times a day and more with full iman salihat, and these two go hand in hand those that also do righteous deeds they have full iman they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they do righteous deeds because you find people that believe in Allah but don't do righteous deeds and you find people that do righteous deeds but they don't believe in Allah so these two go hand in hand 
Whenever we hear the thunder, the dua to make is Subhanalladhi yusabbihu ar-ra'd wal malaikatu min khifatihi. Glory be to the one who makes the thunder, who sends the thunder, and his angels, and the angels are fearful of him, and we are also. Whenever we hear the rain, that is the dua to make. Tayyib. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. That's not it, my brothers. There's four important points here. Those that are not at a loss, those that take advantage of their time, are the ones that believe in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, have full belief in Him. The ones that do righteous deeds, yeah, righteous deeds, and the one that the ones that advise one another upon the truth and advise one another upon patience. Advising one another upon the truth is advising. Your brothers and sisters upon Islam, giving da'wah, calling people to Islam, whether your neighbor or not your neighbor, whether someone that is close to you or not close to you, advising people upon the Quran, whatever that says in the Quran, we advise upon. The Quran says, "Waqulu li nasi husna," and speak well to the people, treat the people kindly. All of these matters, the Quran say, we advise upon it. And those that advise upon patience. How do we advise upon patience? وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ Patience, my brothers, is to hold your back. Hold yourself back at tough times. That is what patience is. الْمَنْعَ الْحَبْسِ To hold yourself back at tough times. I'll give you an example. Patience is on three, of three levels, my brothers. And remember these levels. It's very important. Write them down even if you have to. Number one is that you're patient upon worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الصَّبْرُ عَلَىٰ طَاعَتِهِ حَتَّى تُؤَدَّى You are patient upon worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until you fulfill this worship. Number two, you are patient upon refraining and staying away from sins until you completely stay away from them. الصَّبْرُ عَلَىٰ الْمَعَاصِي حَتَّى تَجْتَنِبْ You are patient upon whatever sin that you commit and we are all Right? We're all fallible. We're not perfect. We commit sins day and night. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith Qudsi, إِنَّكُمْ تُخْطِئُونَ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ That you, O son of Adam, you make mistakes, you error, you sin, night and day. But the best of those are those that repent from their sins. وَكُلُّ إِبْنِ آدَمَ خَطَّاءٌ وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَابُونَ مُطِرْنَا بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ اللَّهُمَ صَيِّبًا نَافِعًا Whenever the Messenger of Allah would hear the rain, he would say, We have been given rain by the bounties of Allah. Mutirna bi fadlillah. And he would also say, Allahumma sayyib and nafi'an. Oh Allah, give us beneficial rain. Make the rain of benefit of us to us as humans and creatures and other creatures as well, like animals. Let them benefit as well. Allahumma hawalayna wa la alayna. Oh Allah, make the rain drop around us and not upon us. What does that mean? Let the rain drop upon the valleys and mountains, not upon us. Too much rain, my brothers, can be harmful to us as well. Floods. As the Sheikh mentioned today, the, the khutbah today, the people of Lut, the people of Nuh, the people of Fir'aun. Sorry, the Fir'aun was destroyed by water. The people of Nuh were destroyed by water. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us beneficial rain and to make the rain drop upon around us and not upon us. Wallahu alam. Tayyip. How long do I have, Bilal? Until Aisha? 20 minutes? Tayyip. Tayyip, it's very important that we finish this off. Watawasaw bil haqi, watawasaw bil sabr. Those that advise each other upon truth and upon patience. Patience, we mentioned, is of three levels. One is that you're patient upon worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until you fulfill it. Two is that you're patient upon not sinning, refraining from sins until you sin, until you stay away from it completely. And three, this is the tough one, this is the hardest one. And this one is out of our control. You're patient upon the divine decree, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the preordainment, that which has been decreed, the good and the bad and the evil, that which has been predestined. And I'll give you an example of each. The first one, you're patient upon worshipping Allah. Waking up Fajr, my brothers, is not easy. Waking up Fajr, getting up from that comfortable bed of yours, lifting up your blanket, 
making wudu, right? On cold mornings, although it's not cold nowadays, but the night, the night is short. Summer's kicking in. The night is going to be shorter, and the day is going to be longer. So Fajr is soon going to be 4:30, 4:45 a.m. And only those with firm belief in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, only those who are the believers, who have trust, will be able to fulfill this and to wake up for Fajr. So you have to be patient upon waking up for Fajr, starting up your car and driving towards the local masjids, whether you live closely or whether you live far away. Walking as well, you have to be patient upon that. You have to be patient upon fasting. Fasting from dawn to dusk, it's not easy, my brothers. You have to be patient upon giving your zakah. We all love our money, but if we've reached that threshold, we have to pay our zakah, my brothers. This money can be a witness against us on the day of judgment. Patient upon the five pillars of Islam, going to Umrah and going to Hajj. We have to be patient upon worship. The second one, being patient upon refraining from sins. You might have a particular sin that you're used to. You might be going to a particular place. You might be watching a particular thing. You might be doing things with your hands or your feet. You have to be patient upon this act. You're not going to refrain from it overnight. You might have an addiction, addiction to pornography, addiction to masturbation, addiction to drugs and alcohol. But you're not going to leave it overnight. You'll leave it gradually, inshallah, by the will of Allah and by His help and by His assistance. And that you're patient upon it and that you regret it every time you do it until you slowly leave it. And the third one, my brothers, you're patient upon the divine decree, things that are outside of your control. You've lost a loved one. Again, today we buried a 24-year-old, 25-year-old that was stabbed to death in these areas, in the northern areas. How would the family feel? What would the reaction of the family be? Sheikh Muhammad, the father, who was one of my mashayikh, who taught us the Quran in Carlton, growing up 10 years ago who taught many of us Quran as well. Very noble man. You have to be patient upon this as well. This was the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the, that the son will die at this particular, this particular day <coughs> in this particular way. You might have lost a, a loved one. A better example is that you're driving your car in the morning towards Fajr. And you're not necessarily speeding but rather a car comes and collides and wipes out your car. Your car becomes a write-off. And perhaps you bought that car recently. You've just paid $20,000, all your savings. Then your patience is tested, my brothers. What are you going to do? Are you going to get mad? Are you going to lose the plot? Are you going to skits it, as they say? Are you going to go on a road rage for something that's materialistic, that was outside of your control? We see brothers and sisters on a road rage, swearing. You have to be patient with yourselves, my brothers and sisters. Yeah? Patience, my brothers and sisters, is from the, best, from the best of characters, the best of characters to have. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all patience. My brothers and sisters, the purpose of life is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a Muslim, you worship Him and serve Him upon that which is correct, sincerely unto Him, and upon that which is on the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you're not and if you're not a non-Muslim if you're not a Muslim then your purpose of life is to search for the truth maybe we can inform our colleagues and co-workers our neighbors those that are non-Muslim and bring them to Islam by telling them that your purpose of life asking them what is the purpose of life from the Islamic point of view and advising them and telling them your purpose of life should be searching for the truth and searching for happiness because happiness, happiness is not in them drinking themselves, in them taking drugs, in them partying. Happiness is worshipping Allah and being reassured and reading the Quran and remembrance in Allah. Ala bidikrillahi tatma'innul qulub. Verily does the heart not find rest and reassurance in the remembrance of Allah. Salman al-Farisi, my brothers, a companion in which many of us have heard about. And I'll summarize his story as we don't have much time. 
he was obviously not an Arab, he was a Persian, Salman al Farisi, he was born in Asfahan, modern day Iran. Abu Abdullah Salman al Farisi. He went through different phases radiallahu anhu in his life. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu reports and he tells him his story, Salman al Farisi. He says, I was a Persian from Asfahan, from a small town named Jayan. My father was a chief of the village. My father was a chieftain. He was the richest person in the town and he had the biggest house. Since I was a child, my father loved me so much, more than anything. As time went on, this love, it grew. He loved me so much, he said he loved me so much that he will imprison him at his house. He will keep him at his house because he didn't want him to, 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 to run away. <coughs> and this father of his was a Majus. And they still have this religion, this ancient religion in Iran. They worship where they worship the fire. I believe it's called Zoroastrian or Zoroastrian, something like that, where they literally worship the fire. So his father was a chief and he's the one that used to flame the fire. So he once told him, Oh Salman, go and make sure these fires don't burn out. That was their religion. The fire is just flamed all day. So Salman, one day he went and done this. He left and came back and he said, this is, this is getting a bit too much. On his way home, he stumbled across Christians, Ahlul Kitab. And he saw them how they practiced their religion in the church. Worshipping how they used to worship. And he said, let me learn from you and pray with you. So they welcomed him. And once his father found this out, he again imprisoned him in his house. And eventually he fled from his father and he was told to go to Asham, Syria, from Persia to Syria, because that is where the Christian belief is, was widely practiced. Even until now, you find Syrian Christians, you find Lebanese Christians, Jordanian Christians, you find Palestinian Christians. So Salman al-Farisi, he, he found a bishop or a priest and he attached himself to this priest. And he told him, let me, let me become like you, a priest, a worshipper. And priests, my brothers, they go through adab. All they have to do is worship and they can't marry. Right? Celibacy. And this is something that, is, that the Prophet ﷺ forbade. Naha Rasulullah tabatul He forbade his companions from not marrying and telling themselves, I never want to marry. So marrying is from the sunnah. So these bishops and priests, for them to be a priest, they can't marry. That is why you find, Wallahu al-Musta'an, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a helper, you find how many priests, they do wrongful acts to little boys. They molest and harass little boys. All because of the punishment they do to themselves, not marrying. So Salman al-Farisi, he also saw how this priest, this particular priest or bishop, was taking the wealth of the people unjustly. And this is mentioned in the Quran that the monks and the priests they take wealth from people unjustly, saying that you're going to give sadaqah, this will be in charity. So he saw this man stash a whole heap of wealth in a particular place. This wealth was never going to charity. He would collect charity, but would never go to charity. And what happened was this priest eventually died. And Salman al Farisi, being a righteous person, and in search of Islam, remember he went from worshipping fire to Christianity. And he told the people that this priest wasn't a good man. He used to take your wealth, tell you that it would go to charity, but he used to stash it up and keep it to himself. And then they said, Wallahi, we'll take him out of his grave and we'll crucify him. And then we'll throw rocks on him. Rajam. And that's exactly what they did. So Salman al Farisi told them where the money was stashed and he gave them the money back. So he left this religion. And he said, I heard of a man in the Arabian Peninsula, meaning Medina, Yathrib, a man that does not take charity and he does not cheat and he, does, and he treats the people nicely and justly. I want to go and find out who this man is. So Salman al-Farisi made the trip from Sham to Medina and on his way there, he was kidnapped and he was enslaved for a particular, for a, for a specific type of years. 
Eventually he made it to Medina. He saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was taken away by a group of Jews. And they used to enslave him. And this goes to show that slavery wasn't just for the blacks or the Africans at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Salman al-Farisi was a slave himself. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was an Arab. And he was a his family were from slaves as well. So slavery, my brothers, as opposed to the Western culture where they enslave people based on their culture, based on their skin color, that is wrong. That is something that we have to deny and we have to stand against. And that is unjust. So Salman al-Farisi was enslaved. Eventually he freed himself and he went to go and questioned the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had three questions with him. Only three questions. He wanted to find out if this, if this man, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, takes charity or does not take charity. If he is truthful and if he is what the people have described to him. So he brought him dates and he said, Ya Rasulullah, this is for you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, is this charity or is this a gift? And he said, this is charity. The Prophet ﷺ distributed it to his companions and said, I don't take charity. And Al Bayt, we know, they don't take any charity. So Salman got his first answer. His second answer was, how does he treat the people? He saw the way the Prophet ﷺ dealt with his companions. He was truthful, he was smiling, he was nice, and he was, <coughs> and he was just. And the third question was, how he tr treats his prisoners? After the battle of Badr, prisoners were captured and at the same time they were fed and they were clothed and they were treated nicely Salman al-Farisi saw this as well and he said this is the time that I must take my Islam and after that my brother Salman al-Farisi became Salman al-Islam as he calls himself I am Salman the Islam this is how he took his shahada and this is a wonderful story in which we can all go back and ponder upon Salman al-Farisi was in search of the truth. Allah uplifted him. Allah expanded his chest and made him embrace Islam. <coughs> the poet, he says, لَعَمْرُكَ مَلْ إِنسَانُ إِلَّا بِدِينِهِ فَلَا تَتْرُكِ التَّقْوَىٰ إِتِّكَالًا عَلَى النَّسَبِ By your life, what is a person without a religion? We've seen people who are atheists. They do the weirdest things due to them not having religion and denying Allah. They'll say weird things. They'll do weird things. What is a person without his religion? فَلَا تَتْرُكِ التَّقْوَىٰ إِتِّكَالًا عَلَى النَّسَبِ Do not leave taqwa. Do not leave piety. Relying on your lineage. Do not say, I'm from this family and that qabila and that tribe and that village. We are the best of people because we have ulama, because we have this. Those people are not going to, they're not going to intercede for you on the day of judgment. You will be judged accordingly. You will be judged only for your deeds and not other people's. فَقَدْ رَفَعَ الْإِسْلَامُ سَلْمَانَ فَارِسٍ وَقَدْ وَضَعَ الشِّرْكُ الشَّرِيفَ أَبَى لَهَبِ Islam has indeed raised Salman al-Farisi, a Persian who was enslaved and then freed. Islam gave people like Salman al-Farisi high ranks. Bilal ibn Rabbah al-Habashi who was a black slave, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who was from the lower tribes, the marginalized tribes of the Quraysh, not even the Quraysh, of the Arabs. Islam is the one that uplifted them. وَقَدْ وَضَعَ الشِّرْكُ الشَّرِيفَ أَبَى لَهَبِي And Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, what humiliated him was him denying Islam, him rejecting Islam, him believing in false gods, how much times do we recite this? A surah that many of us know. And this surah will continue up until the last day. Until the last, <coughs> until the last hour. So my brothers and sisters, the purpose of life is for us to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Serve Him in sincere worship. And in accordance to, in accordance in his, in accordance to his legislation. And if you're not, if you're not a non-Muslim, your purpose of life is to search for the truth, search for happiness, search for the truth, i.e. Al-Islam. That is what we have been created for. And I want to finish up with a few points, inshaAllah. How many minutes? 
A few words of advice. A few words of advice, my brothers. Number one, start your day early. Be a productive person. Number, th- number two, limit social media. And I'm speaking to the younger brothers. Limit social media. Social media is a drug. Number three, surround yourselves with the elites. Surround yourselves with the elites. Yani people who are more knowledgeable than you in the deen and people who earn more than you in life. Because then that way you'll be uplifted. And number four, your prayer. Number four, your prayer, my brothers. Salah. Salah is what will make or break you. Salah is the first thing you will be held accountable for on the day of judgment. And if that is successful, then perhaps the next 50% of your deeds will be successful. But salah is the main thing. And my brothers and sisters, salah is what differentiates us between Muslims, between being a Muslim and a non-Muslim. Salah is the best of acts. The best of deed in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praying salah at its given time. And I want to finish off with this story. Young brothers, my brother, young brothers in Saudi, they were traveling from Medina to Riyadh. And my brothers and sisters, these young brothers, they weren't people that used to pray. In fact, they, have no, they had no hayat, no shyness. Because the taxi driver that took them, and anyone that has been to Mecca and Medina or Riyadh, you have to travel through taxi through other cities. And there's a taxi driver. And this taxi driver, he stopped at a, partic- at a petrol station halfway. And being a Muslim country, they have masallah, they have prayers, they have p- places where you can pray everywhere. And he told these young brothers, four of them, let's go and pray. One of them said, I don't pray. One of them literally said, I don't pray. Nobody in their entire life, my brothers, with a sound mind, does not say, I don't pray. A particular, uh, a, a, a typical teen, a typical young Young lads, what they will do is they will maybe go to the toilet, play with their phone. They will maybe pretend to make wudu and come back to the car, which is a normal of a typical person. But these, these brothers, they had no shyness. They said, we don't pray. And this taxi driver, he was a smart person. He did not curse them. He did not shout and say, you must pray. You're going to go to hellfire if you don't pray. He said, come and try. He told one of them, come and try, make wudu and pray. See how you feel. Just give it a shot. One of them, my brothers, they prayed. And after that prayer, in the sujood, he did not get up. In this sujood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his life away, his soul away. And my brothers and sisters, here we are, neglecting our prayers. And we have a young brother, or young, young adult who never used to pray but decided to pray one day, make wudu the correct way, and then pray. And Allah made him die in the state. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us, وَإِنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ لَيَعْمَلُوا بِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ النَّارِ حَتَّى مَا يَكُونُوا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهَا إِلَّا ذِرَاعٍ فَيَسْبِقُ عَلَيْهِ الْكِتَابِ فَيَكُونُ, فيكون مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ فَيَدْخُلُهَا أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام One of you will do acts that are from the people of the hellfire, not praying. Until the qadr precedes you or until the table turns and then you do an act of the people of Jannah the people of paradise and you die in that state this man died praying so what will be our last state we have to increase in the du'as we have to increase in our prayers we have to take our prayers seriously my brothers how many people pray and neglect prayer the messenger Sallallahu tells us that a person will pray for 60 years of his life and will not be accepted why he will not pray the sujood right. <coughs> the sujood. Maybe the wudu was incorrect. Maybe his ruku' wasn't correct. For 60 years, and no prayer will be accepted. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grant us iman and ikhlas and make us of those who pray on time. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He benefit us from these lectures and all the lectures. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He corrects us and he, that He guides us and He keeps us steadfast. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى نَبِيْنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَجَز